Thank you. I'm, I'm Jeff Olke from White and & Case, and I'm moderating the panel on patentable subject matter. And as you can imagine, when I was asked to do this months ago, I sat down, I tried to read a bunch of cases on 101, a bunch of briefs, and then the Mayo case came down from the Supreme Court, and I felt like I had to start over and read all those cases and briefs all again in, in light of that case coming down from the Supreme Court. Section 101 is really, it functions as a gatekeeper, and it has gone back and forth over time at the Supreme Court, at the Federal Circuit, and there's been a real wrestling with the problem of how do we use Section 101. Is it used as a screen? Who uses it as a screen? When should it be used as a screen for the patentable process? So we have some of the leading practitioners and academics that have published and um, argued on this issue extensively here today. Professor Daniel Ravitcher is the Executive Director of the Public Patent Foundation, and he's a lecturer in law at Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. He's a registered patent attorney. He writes and speaks frequently on patents and public policy and has testified before Congress on patent reform and was named one of the 50 most influential people <coughs> in IP by Managing Intellectual Property Magazine. Hmm. Next to him is Professor John Duffy. He's the Armistead M. Doby Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. He publishes extensively on issues relating to intellectual property, including on patentable subject matter. And he's been identified as one of the 25 most influential people in IP by the American lawyer and as a legal visionary by the Legal Times for his scholarship. Next to him, Seth Waxman, a partner at Wilmer Hale and chair of their appellate and Supreme Court litigation practice group. He was Solicitor General of the United States from 1997 to 2001. He has argued 56 oral arguments before the Supreme Court. So that's what his bio tells us. 62. He's up to 62 now. Yeah, true. <laughs> Need to update that uh, on the website. Every 10 years. <laughs> He's been involved in many, many IP appeals, including on issues relating to patentable subject matter. He was named Bet the Company Litigator of the Year for 2010 by Best Lawyers in America and is one of the top 10 super lawyers in Washington, D.C. And next to him is Professor Mark Lemley, the William H. Newcomb Professor of Law at Stanford. He's the director, as most of you know, of Stanford's program in law, science, and technology and is also a founding partner at Dury Tangri LLP. Among his honors, he was named the California Lawyers Attorney of the Year, and in 2009, received the California State Bar's inaugural IP Vanguard Award. Professor Lemley's going to give us a summary of what the Supreme Court did in the Mayo case, and then we'll start in on some questions. <clears throat> All right, well, um, uh, Many of you, I suspect, have at least some passing familiarity with Mayo. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, is tell you a little bit about what the court did, in part uh, by, uh, by looking to the court's own language and set, um, set the, the stage for some discussion. So the uh, patent in Mayo versus Prometheus uh, involved uh, treatment of uh, autoimmune diseases with thiopurine drugs. Uh, and the patentee's claimed invention um, uh, stemmed from the patentee's discovery of the right uh, level of metabolization in the human body of a thiopurine drug. Uh, thiopurine drugs had been uh, well known and used in the treatment of autoimmune diseases before. Uh, what the patentee claimed was a process of administering the drugs to a patient, something that had already been done before. Um, 
measuring how each patient metabolized that drug, because every human metabolizes drugs at a different rate. Um, and then a clause, uh, rather curious in its drafting, that said, wherein a metabolization rate below a certain level indicates a need to raise the drug dosage, and wherein uh, a metabolization rate above a certain level indicates a need to lower the drug dosage. It did not actually say, uh, administer a modified drug dosage to the patient, uh, though one might think that was uh, implicit in the instructions to the doctor. Uh, case went to the district court uh, in Southern California, which held it was not patentable subject matter. Uh, the Federal Circuit reversed and said, under the Bilski machine or transformation test, uh, you are transforming a patient necessarily whenever you're administering a drug. There's a step of administering a drug in this claim, and therefore there's a physical transformation. Supreme Court granted certiorari, vacated the opinion, and remanded it in light of its Bilski opinion, where it had said machine or transformation, while an important clue uh, to patentability, is not the sole test. It went back to the Federal Circuit, uh, and the Federal Circuit on remand said, yeah, it's not the sole test, but here you satisfy the transformation step, and we think that should be sufficient. Uh, it, it looked, uh, as you described the court's opinion, like a safe harbor. Um, uh, the court granted certiorari again, uh, never a good sign um, uh, for the Court of Appeals opinion. And um, despite an oral argument in November that I think a lot of, had a lot of people thinking that the court was really struggling with this issue and, uh, and was troubled by the implications of a broad patentable subject matter holding, gave us in March 9-0 a broad patentable subject matter holding. Uh, and in that case, uh, the court said a number of things which I think are going to be of great importance uh, going forward in the life sciences industry uh, for patentable subject matter. The, the focus in the court offered was on the uh, law of nature doctrine. Laws of nature, the court has long said, are unpatentable. Merely discovering a law of nature can't get you a patent. The question, therefore, the court says is, uh, you need to transform an unpatentable law of nature into a patent-eligible application of such a law. And to do that, the court says, one must do more than simply state the law of nature while adding the words, apply it. Uh, so a practical application of a law of nature is not sufficient. You've got to have something more, uh, some additional element. What's that additional element? Well, here the court starts to use language uh, which is going to turn out, I think, to be quite significant. Our cases, they, the court said, insist that a process that focuses upon the use of a natural law also contain other elements or a combination of elements, sometimes referred to as an inventive concept, sufficient to ensure that the patent in practice amounts to significantly more than a patent on the natural law itself. So the introduction here of the idea that the inventive concept must come not from the law of nature, but from the things you add to the law of nature, I think is quite a significant one uh, that is going to have, have substantial implications in the future. So the court says, well, the question for us is whether the claims do significantly more than describe these natural relations. Do they add enough to their statements of correlations to allow the processes uh, they describe to qualify as patent eligible uh, processes that apply natural laws? The court's answer to that question is no. Um, the court focuses on the determining step. Uh, figuring out whether the metabolization rate is too high or too low. And it says of that uh, uh, step, well, uh, that step merely tells doctors to engage in well-understood routine conventional activity previously engaged in by scientists who work in the field. Purely conventional or obvious pre-solution activity is normally not sufficient to transform an unpatentable law of nature into a patent-eligible application of such a law. So while you have, in fact, brought us new information, the correct range of dosage for a thiopurine drug, uh, the steps that actually get performed in the patent claims, administering the drug in the first place, and adjusting drug dosages generally are well understood routine conventional activity. And because those steps are conventional or obvious, even though the information in the law of nature is new, uh, they don't add anything sufficient to render the invention patentable. Right, they, the claims inform a relevant audience about certain laws of nature. Any additional steps consist of well-understood routine conventional activity, and those steps, when viewed as a whole, add nothing significant. 
So the question then, I think, becomes for the court, well, what significant things do we have to add? Um, and that's a problem I think we're going to discuss in the, on the uh, panel, and so I'm not going to go into detail in trying to parse out what I think the court is likely to require. Um, but I do want to flag several other things the court said that are significant for the patentable subject matter inquiry. First, with respect to the machine or transformation test. The Federal Circuit had said it passes the machine or transformation test. And while Bilski indicated that that's not the be all and end all, it's not the only way you can render an invention unpatentable, uh, the Federal Circuit had indicated machine or transformation ought to be a safe harbor. Uh, the Supreme Court, I think, clearly rejects that approach. It says, um, in stating that the machine or transformation test is an important and useful clue to patentability, we have neither said nor implied that the test trumps the law of nature exclusion. Uh, so even if you pass machine or transformation, you're not out of the woods. Uh, if you are, in fact, merely uh, applying a law of nature using conventional or obvious steps. Second, the government and a number of amici had argued uh, that uh, even if this particular patent didn't seem like a great one, um, the problem with the patent lay in section 102 or 103. It lay in the fact that the world was already engaging in uh, uh, recognizing the fact that metabolization differed from person to person and responding to it. And the proper way for the court to analyze validity was accordingly under either the uh, novelty and non-obviousness doctrines or under section 112. Well, um, the court rejects that argument uh, in some detail, walking through the uh, what it views as some of the limitations of 102, 103, and 112, uh, and uh, uh, it's concluding that it must, quote, decline the government's invitation to substitute 102, 103, and 112 inquiries for the better established inquiry under section 101. Uh, now, it does not come out and say, uh, you've got to do 101 first. It's a threshold question, although uh, the fact that the court uh, seems to think 101 is the, the primary question you ought to be asking in cases like these has led at least one district court to conclude uh, that after Mayo, uh, Section 101 is a threshold inquiry, is something we have to resolve first, even if, as is arguably the case here, you could have struck this patent down on 102 or 103 grounds uh, without reaching the 101 issue. Now, for patent prosecutors uh, uh, and, and uh, anybody who's interested in, in trying to maintain validity of patents, uh, the next obvious question, which I think the panel will also discuss, is, well, you know, how do I draft around this? How do I write my patent claim so that I can, in fact, uh, uh, cover uh, my new invention and add the limitations the court is going to find sufficient. Well, the court has a message for you, which is don't bother. Um, the, uh, the court twice makes reference to uh, uh, draftsmen and uh, the form of the claim and how that shouldn't matter. Uh, its cases, the court says, quote, warn us against interpreting patent statutes in ways that make patent eligibility depend simply on the draftsman's art without reference to the principles underlying the prohibition against, uh, against patents for natural laws, uh, and then goes on to say, um, uh, if a law of nature is not patentable, then neither is a process reciting a law of nature unless that process has additional features that provide practical assurance that the process is more than a drafting effort designed to monopolize the law of nature itself. Uh, that doesn't mean, I think, you can't write valid patent claims, uh, but it means that adding steps uh, that don't impose significant limitations on the scope of those patent claims is, in the court's view, insufficient. Finally, the court offers uh, a bit of a sop to the life sciences industry, uh, but only a bit. Um, in talking about whether had the uh, uh, patentee added a bunch of other steps that were less conventional that were not known in the art, uh, the court says, uh, well, we don't have to decide that question. And it, it goes on to say, Unlike, say, a typical patent on a new drug or a new way of using an existing drug, the patent claims do not confine their reach to particular applications of those laws. So if you're in the pharmaceutical business, you might breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. The court doesn't view, at least it doesn't seem to view, its opinion as rendering new drug patents uh, unpatentable. Uh, though it's worth noting that uh, a mere paragraph earlier, the court had pointed out that the problem with the Prometheus claims was not 
breadth. Indeed, it noted that the law of nature in question, the right dosage for thiopurine drugs and treating autoimmune diseases was quite narrow, narrow laws that have limited applications. That, the court said, didn't save them because the patent claims that embody them nonetheless implicate the law of nature concern. You are monopolizing the law of nature even if the law of nature here is a very narrow and specific one. So that leaves us, I think, uh, uh, both with respect to biotechnology cases like DNA uh, and with respect to medical diagnostic and therapeutic process cases uh, with a fair bit of uncertainty as to exactly what the limits are, but with some indication that the world has changed in a fairly significant way, uh, particularly given the court's focus on uh, trying to find the novelty and obviousness of the invention not in the newly discovered law of nature, but in the additional steps you add to that law of nature? There's a lot in there to cover. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> but we're going to get to lunch, I promise. So let's start with the language, simply appending conventional steps. This is right out of the Mayo decision. Specified at a high level of generality to the laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas cannot make those laws, phenomena, and ideas patentable. Does that conventional step language conflate patentable subject matter under 101 with the other in inquiries for anticipation and obviousness under 102 and 103? And I'll start with Professor Duffy because he's, he's looking at me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to do that in the future. <laughs> Um, I don't think it, I mean, th there's, a, there's a broad debate about whether the, the Supreme Court is, is uh, trying to use, trying to consider everything that we consider in separate sections of the statute, trying to sort of load all of that into Section 101. Um, and I think there's some claim that it does do that in the sense that the, the Supreme Court in 101 analysis looks at a lot of the factors that sort of skilled patent pr uh, professionals will notice uh, could be slotted into other areas of the statute. Um, and I think what they are doing is they're trying to give us, the Supreme Court is trying to give us a message which we don't like as patent practitioners because we think it's sloppy. Uh, they're trying to say that in 101, all of the merits of the invention can be considered and all of the factors that go to the underlying policies of the statute are uh, fair game. And we don't like that because we think, well, wait, that's a 101 issue, that's a 102 issue, that's a 103 issue, that's a 112 issue. And I think they think about it in a completely different way, which is, well, maybe those inquiries are, have their own separate places in the statute, but that's actually a, a, a reason why they should be considered as part of the general 101 analysis. Because 101 analysis allows you to sort of blend those things together along with this sort of common law jurisprudence that has developed along with 101 and, and, and then can, and sort of go directly to the merits of the, uh, what they think is sort of a threat, what they do say, some, what they say sometimes is a threshold issue. Uh, and therefore, we may not like that message. We may think it's sloppy, but the, the very sloppiness is exactly why the Supreme Court is attracted to the analysis. They like to be able to decide very, very fundamental issues. And of course, if they're going to decide a very fundamental issue like, is this patentable at all, they are going to look to policies that are codified elsewhere in the statute too. So I think that patent practitioners arguing these 101 cases should not run away from that and should not think that if they say, if, if they say oh, that's a 103 issue, that that somehow means it's not relevant to the 101 inquiry. Uh, you, I think the, the right response for a court is to say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in the very particular analysis of 103, but the reason it's being used in 101 is because those issues, of the obviousness and the, and the, um, the, the level of detail, which you would think of as a 112 issue, uh, um, the level of detail and the, and the particularity with which you've claimed this, those issues get merged in 101 and provide this, this general analysis where we, especially we, the Supreme Court, get to ask this fundamental question of, does this claim 
at least arguably advance any of the policies that Congress wanted to advance when it enacted the patent statute. So they do consider all jo those But John, things. can I, yes. I, I mean, the problem I think is, uh, I, I have no problem with a kind of holistic analysis if we take seriously the claim as a whole. What I think is the, is the difficulty here is that the courts used that merging of 101 with 102 and 103 as a way to put a rabbit in a hat and to say when it looks at the piece of the invention that really is novel, Right? The fact that I discovered a range people didn't know about and therefore can, in, can inform doctors uh, you should be treating, it, uh, you, di treating people so that the, the drug dosage is in this range, they say, oh, well, that's, uh, that standing alone doesn't meet the 101 test, so we can ignore it. And then when we go and look at all the, state, all the other things that are practical applications, uh, we say, well, those don't meet the 102 or 103 test, so we can ignore them, when in fact, if you look at the thing as a whole, Right, you have, I, now, I don't want to defend this claim because I think it's got some problems, right? But, but you, I, I, you, I think you often end up in situations where there is a practical application of something that is newly discovered about the world, um, and you're limited to that practical application, but if we pretend when we look at the newly discovered piece that that can't count because it's 101, and we pretend when we look at the practical application piece that that can't count because those are practical applications we've used in other contexts before, the whole ends up being less than the sum of its parts. Well, I, I think that the, the crucial question which you're getting at, which is I think the most fundamental question when you get away from the semantics of is this under 101 or is it under 103, is the very fundamental question that in deciding obviousness, which you decide under, I don't, and I don't care whether you say it's part of 101 analysis or part of 103 analysis, when you decide whether something is obvious, do you subtract away the newly discovered principle of nature? That is a very, very fundamental question, and that is the core of what's, what we're fighting about. And actually, in the Breyer opinion in this case, there's good language for a pro-patentable language, because it, it actually says, well, in 103, we've never said We've never said in 103 cases that you subtract away, whether you add in what I like to call a, a fictional p library of prior art. The fictional pri pri uh, library of prior art is nature's library. Nature's library, even if it wasn't known before, is always a storehouse of knowledge that you assume was in the prior art. The buyer's opinion says we've never said that in 103. And that's actually really, really important and very, very good language. And if you look back at this, this fiction of, of assuming it was in the prior art, the, the oldest case it came from was the English case that they, that they discuss involving um, you know, the, the new discovery of this, of this principle that hot air fires uh, uh, furnaces better than cold air. Um, and of course, that comes from a time when there was no obviousness filter in the statute. That was English law in the early 19th century. English law in the early 19th century absolutely positively did not have an obviousness principle. It's absolutely clear. So if you, there you use this saying of, well, you know, we assume this is, um, was in the, we assume that that was well known, but that didn't really matter in that age because they weren't asking the obviousness question. They were just asking the novelty question. So I don't, I, there's some good language in what Breyer says uh, about the 103 analysis, and I think we'll have to wait to see whether that migrates over to this 101 in, that in, analysis that includes 103. What makes me nervous here, I think, is both in this case and in Bilski, the rehabilitation of Parker versus Fluke, right? Because I think Parker versus Fluke is the case in 1978 that got that issue wrong. Right, that said, we got to pretend all of these mathematical algorithms, laws of nature are known even though they are in fact unknown. Um, that, in my view, only lasted three years. Three years later, right. the court essentially overruled it in Diamond versus Deer. Uh, and what's remarkable about these cases is 30 years later, um, the, the court reads Parker versus Fluke and Diamond versus Deer, which are uh, uh, decided by uh, uh, five four majorities that, that, uh, that have no overlap between them, um, and, and tries to read them all as consistent. And yes, of course, those are both part of our case law, when in fact they're essentially irreconcilable. And the, so my worry is that doing that basically is moving us back towards a world in which Parker versus Fluke is the law and we don't get to count anything we've discovered about the world uh, towards our obviousness inquiry. 
Yeah. Well, again, it, I just want to make it clear that the court has never said, that, never invoked that principle in 103 cases. And in, in fact, if you read just 103 cases, you'd say that's clearly inconsistent with 103 principles. You now have the statement by Breyer in this opinion that says that you don't do that in 103. And you look at 103 analysis, and they repeatedly say it's supposed to be a pragmatic analysis. Well, there's nothing you know, more anti-pragmatic than to assume that there's some fictional nature's library out there that includes all principles of natural law that have already been known, even though we don't know them. So I think that in the 10, what they've done in 101 is, is a mishmash, which includes all of these considerations. And it is true that in Parker versus Fluke, which is clearly a 101 case, they, they, they have this statement that they, that they consider it. A lot of these cases involve 112 element. What, again, I'm speaking in patent lingo here to the, to the audience, assuming this is a very, very sophisticated audience, which I'm sure is true. But it's 112 problem. Even in this case, the way Breyer sets up this opinion is he says you have to apply it. You can't just say, uh, here's the natural law, apply it. And you know, up to that and when point. When you do, pay me a license. And pay me a license fee. And, and up to that point, you think, if, even if you're the most fire eating, pro patentable subject, pro patenting uh, a person, you'd still think, of course, that you can't do that. Because if you just say, apply it, you haven't taught the person how to apply it, which is essential, which is required under 112. And maybe, you know, this, this curious element that you noted, in, Mark, in your, in your beginning, which is to say that the, the, the steps here didn't even say reduce the dosage or increase the dosage. It was just said wherein it indicates. And, and Breyer notes that in his opinion. He says it's just a suggestion, at most a suggestion, that you might think about reducing it or, or increasing the dosage. Um, that, I think, might be, you know, that certainly is a huge, huge weakness in this, in this case and allowed Breyer to go from that correct premise, which is you can't just say, here's the law of nature, apply it. Um, you can't, that's, ver that's clearly true, and then it allows him to reach the result here. And I think the way to interpret this opinion is to start with that absolutely correct premise and say this is an application of that premise. Yeah, I would say, um, just to butt into this very interesting dialogue <laughs> clear, please, please do. Just to, just to sort of step back from some of the sort of technical discussion about 103 doctrine and 112 doctrine and of course 102 is, you know, how does one approach, how does anybody in the patent world, whether you are an inventor, a developer, a competitor, a, what is it, a draftman, an draftsman, artif draftsman, draftsman. a draftsman, uh, or a litigator approach this thing. Um, I mean, when I uh, went to work in the, in the Solicitor General's office, there, we had something called a, a special lawyer called the tax assistant to the Solicitor General, which was an artifact of an era in which the Supreme Court, you know, took a lot of tax cases. And it was generally understood in the tax bar and generally in the tax paying, sophisticated tax paying world, that every time the Supreme Court of the United States took a tax case, there was a collective shudder and cringe because the court would apply some highly generalist, quite uninformed, sort of broad gauge view and write an opinion which quite inadvertently, well, advertently didn't pay particular attention to laws and regulations in an area that is characterized by precision, and also would use all sorts of vernacular terms, or what it thought were vernacular terms, but to anybody in the field were terms of art when, as expressed by the United States Supreme Court, made no sense. And so, and I think very much the same has happened with the Supreme Court's recent attention on patent cases in general. And this is, this is, this is exhibit A for all eternity. This is an area of the law because we're talking about property rights and monopolies and exclusions um, in which precision is critical. 
And a lot of the doctrine that has developed in 102 and 103 and 105 and 112 are in fact quite precise, you know, sometimes statutory but often judge-made principles, doctrines, and, and presumptions that people practicing in the area, both inventors and lawyers and, and uh, you know, financiers and competitors can sort of understand and get traction in. And that's not a world that any Supreme Court justice is familiar with. And it's also not what Section 101 is about. Section 101 is a, gr a broad grant of authority that you know, says whoever invents or discovers any new or useful process machine, manufacturer, composition, et cetera, et cetera, may obtain a patent subject to the conditions and requirements of this title, i.e. the subsequent provisions. And the limitation, that it is not a provision of limitation in, or exclusion in any way. The limitations have built up through uh, judicial doctrines, principally the Supreme Court's doctrines, so there's the law of nature and natural process exceptions. And what the Supreme Court seems to have done in this case, unanimously, is to say, well, those limitations need to have force. And if you read Section 101 the way it's actually read, which is if you invent any new or useful thing, you can get a patent subject to the following conditions and requirements. What that really means is that the 101 analysis, which contains no bright lines, no lines of any sort, will incorporate all the lines that, that, that ensue in the following sections of the Patent Act. And that, you know, that creates a big problem for everybody in the patent world except people like me who are sort of generalist litigators who like doing patent cases because this is minimum of 20 years of litigation <laughs> confusion, um, uh, which more or less guarantees that if I ever retire in any event when I die, there will still be lots of really great head-scratching cases to bring to district courts and the federal circuit and, and try and help them wrestle with. Personally, I mean, I think, and you know, from I, I would be surprised if people thought otherwise in this room, the court could have done us a great favor by ending its opinion on page eight, um, which is, you know, when they explain what the general principles are and explain what the, dis what the patent claims are and the disputes here and why it fails, and before they launch into what what Mark has explained, I think, if I can, if I, if I interpret the tenor of your remarks as a highly inscrutable, if nonetheless uh, apparently scholarly uh, deconstruction of Parker, Deere, and you know, God help us, the ancient English precedents to which we all must pay obeisance, um, and. You know, and, I, and, and in this regard, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop, you know, so others can jump in, you know, perhaps even Dan. <laughs> um, He's saving his ammunition for, his uh, for myriads. Yeah, so, but I mean, I think generally speaking, I find it very difficult to believe that nine justices of the Supreme Court thought that the holding in this case is as broad as a great many people either proclaim or fear. And I think when you really come down to it, the, you know, the, the real holding, the, the key passage, and I can't remember, Mark, whether this is one of the tidbits that you read or not, is on page four, uh, which is the, the, the very last few sentences of the introductory section. They say, in particular, the steps in the claimed processes involve well understood routine conventional activity previously engaged in by researchers in the field and at the same time upholding the patents would risk disproportionately tying up the use of the underlying natural laws inhibiting their use in the making of further discoveries. What The way they read these patent claims was exactly the way that Mark 
characterize the opening line of their opinion, which is, here is a law of nature. Go ahead and apply it in any way that you think is useful, and please remit royalty payments to us at this place. I, I, and the Supreme Court has basically said, you have to do something more. This doesn't do something more because Prometheus was, Prometheus never walked away from the expressed fear that any physician, any researcher who thought about the level of metabolites in connection with a potential therapeutic result or marker would, by, simply by virtue of thinking about that, be infringing the patent. And I think that's what nine justices find unacceptable, and all the rest, I believe, is mischief. So, I mean, I think there's something substantial to that, right? I, th this claim was unattractive, and I think should have been unattractive to the court, just as the patent claims in Bilski were unattractive and probably should have been unattractive to the court. And there's no question that that's driving, in part, the, the court's result. Um, you know, I'm, I'm less confident, I think, uh, uh, than Seth is that uh, the result is accordingly going to be limited to that, in part because the court doesn't stop with that language. And even, so the language that Seth just read you is the, is the sort of key point. He said, the steps in the claimed processes involve well understood routine conventional activity. Um, he actually left out a parenthetical in that line. What it says is the steps in the claimed processes apart from right. the natural laws themselves, pre involve well understood routine conventional activity previously engaged in by researchers. So I think there's, you know, if, if the Supreme Court were in fact to take 40 of these cases, and some of those cases had real inventions with good facts and limited narrow claims, I think we might get a useful common law development that actually gave us some valuable uh, insights. They're not gonna take 40 of these cases. They're probably not even, they're probably gonna take one more of these cases, the Myriad case, um, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, but they we're then gonna be left with all of this language and, you know, c could you interpret the language narrowly? Well, maybe if you squint a lot at it, but I actually think the problem is the language is awfully broad and it's awfully vague. You can say the facts of the cases are in fact ones that justify only narrow language, but I don't think the language is all that narrow. Now, to be fair, I don't know that we lay need to lay this, uh, blame for this at the door of the Supreme Court particularly. Right? I don't think this is part of a general problem the Supreme Court has in understanding patent cases. I actually think as a general matter they've done extremely well in the patent cases they've taken in the last 10 years. Um, uh, I think it's a problem with 101. I mean, the reason that there's vague language that turns out to create all of these problematic conundrums uh, and would reach too broadly is there isn't actually uh, a golden bullet, a, a great way to interpret section 101 that imposes the limits the court wants to impose and yet uh, gets us patentability of all of the things we instinctively think are patentable. And I'm not sure, no matter how hard we look for it, we're gonna find one. That's the error, in my view, in the Supreme Court's analysis, which is interpreting a, a broad plenary yes. grant of authority subject to enumerated limitations and trying to essentially outline in a very rough way all the contours of those limitations in the context of a broad grant of authority. But that's where we are. The, the language that I think uh, Mr. Waxman referred to, which is that the patent law not inhibit further discovery by tying up the future use of a law of nature, that language without reference to conventional steps, without reference to things that sound like obviousness, could there have been, could this case have been decided on a preemption basis without going into what was conventional and what was known before? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's case law that says you can't preempt the use of a law of nature. The court simply could have said, this is a law of nature. It's hard for us to think of anything if the law of nature is how does the uh, methiamine uh, get metabolized in the human body that couldn't uh, that could be done that wouldn't involve administering thiamine to the human body and then figuring out how it was metabolized, um, and period, we're done. Uh, and that would leave open the possibility that, you know, if you'd added uh, uh, certain kinds of, of uh, therapeutic steps, if you'd added some kinds of limitations, you might have had a narrower claim. It wouldn't have opened the Parker versus Fluke 
can of worms about whether we count the law of nature as, as new and, and non-obvious. Um, and I think it would have been consistent with the court's precedent. I think there's also some a, a point about authorship here. This was authored by Justice Breyer. Um, and I think he would say, I mean, probably this opinion essentially it does say that. It does say something like preemption, if, even if I didn't use that word. That word is not a magic word. Well, the language that he said here is totally consistent with what the court has said with preemption, which this idea of preemption. So I think that you know the, the, the reason that Breyer spells this out in the detail that he does is because that's what Breyer does. That's the way Breyer writes his opinions. And that's another important point to remember here. This opinion, though it's unanimous, um, comes in the patent area. And there's an old saying among Supreme Court practitioners that the, the most likely result in some cases, 9-0, I win. The second most likely result is 9-0, I lose. If the judges, you know, heard, especially on issues that are not the sort of core constitutional issues that they all develop very, very well-developed views on, they heard much more in these cases, whether they be a tax case or a patent case. Um, so I think that this is Breyer, everything you see in here is Breyer's view very, very clearly. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that five years down the road, something different could come out of the court, just like what already happened with the Fluke case, right? There was Fluke, and then there was Deere. And yeah. as, Mark, as Mark said, well, those two cases are very, very hard to put them side by side and say they're consistent. And of course, the, you know that they're not consistent because the dissenter in the one case is writing the majority opinion in the other case, and the dissenter in the, in the uh, Deere case is, it, it was the author of the other opinion saying, and he's saying this is not fair to what was said in Fluke, meaning what I said in Fluke. So the authorship here is a major thing to remember about this, about this case. So it's a little, it's a, it, it, it's, you, should, you should remember there's the possibility of a Deere coming within a few years after this look. Professor Ravitcher, do you want to comment on uh, the preemption doctrine and whether or not this case would have been better decided under that doctrine? Let me try to give an explanation for why I think the frustration and the unpredictability in this area of law is a good thing. Um, every area of the law has a constant battle between hard and fast rules and fuzzy standards. Hard and fast rules are easy to administer. You have to be 21 years old to drink. You have to speed limit 65 miles per hour. It is what it is. Uh, but we get a lot of false negatives and false positives. We get a lot of people who should be allowed to drink under the age of 21 and a lot of people who shouldn't be allowed to drink over the age of 21. With fuzzy standards, we have a very difficult time implementing them, a very difficult time predicting them, a very difficult time counseling our clients about them. They're very frustrating. They're slippery snakes we can't hold on to. We can't see into the future. I tell my students this is a cha-ching issue. By cha-ching, how many of you guys saw the Wendy's commercial from about 20 years ago, where they're going cha-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching on the cash register, right? So this is gonna keep my students and me employed, so it's a good thing for that reason. Um, but secondarily, this is an issue which is so critical to so many different compelling interests that we have as a country. We wanna make sure we get it right. We want to make sure we make the right decision in each case. And if we have to go through a very frustrating, unpredictable process with language that doesn't have a lot of meat on the bones and doesn't allow us to make predictions, that's okay because we want to make sure we get it right. We want to make sure a lot of smart people, a district court judge, at least three judges at the Court of Appeals, nine justices at the Supreme Court, all look at this issue and we get various opinions, which is the sign of intelligence, the sign of a good society that we have disagreement. I wouldn't want everyone to agree on these issues. Uh, that's how we know that going future, all the various interests, the incentive-backed expectations that most uh, of you care about, the access uh, that most of my clients care about, that these competing interests get adequately represented. What I found most, I, I do agree the preemption issue, one that we'll talk about AMP, I don't know this myriad case you're talking about, I know a case called AMP. Um, the preemption issue was completely ignored by the Federal Circuit. They didn't discuss it at all uh, in the Judge Lori and Judge Moore opinion. 
Uh, and I think now this clearly is a sign from the Supreme Court that it has to be considered. But let me tell you the one thing about the Mayo opinion that jumped out to me the most that no one's yet mentioned was the fact that the Supreme Court felt it important to talk about what Mayo wanted to do. How is what an accused infringer wants to do relevant to whether or not the patent is on eligible subject matter? And the Supreme Court wanted to point out that what Mayo wanted to do was different in slight ways, different numbers, different ranges, than what Prometheus had patented. Why did they do that? Because that's expressing in a very indirect, inefficient way that there's this interest of we don't want to shut down other productive activity. Okay, and then the most, con the most insightful issue here is that this deals with medical care. Okay, we were talking about cell phones. We were even talking about the internet. I don't think it would provoke the same emotional, passionate, uh, aggressive tone and language that this opinion has, at least it speaks to me, that the lower court, the Court of Appeals twice wrote about. But we're talking about medical care and this access in people's lives. And I think because we aren't addressing that issue, uh, we're not going to have this one-on-one -on -one issue settled. And I know it's moving parts. I know in the AMP case, had there been a fair use for patents that would allow my clients to get the genetic testing that Myriad refused to give them because my clients are poor white people, we would have never brought our case. We would not have the AMP case had there been a fair use which entitled patients to get access to the medical information about their own bodies that their doctors have told them to have. So I don't want to get into that whole conversation yet, but we have to recognize that the 101 issue, although we can sit in this conference room today and we can really focus in on it, in the real world as a practical mechanic, I call myself. I'm not a theorist in any way the way that John and Mark uh, and even Seth are. I'm a mechanic. I roll up my sleeves and get grease on my fingers. Uh, but looking at it that way, you have to scale back out and say, what is the real world that this is going on? We have a health care debate. We have going on in this country about access to medical care, who's going to pay for it. And this triggering those emotions, I think, bled over. And it's not, I think, coincidental that this decision came out around the same time that the big Obamacare case was being litigated. I don't think those two things are completely separated. So, and I also wanted to thank Mark and everyone for having me here today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for the rest of the panelists for uh, letting me join them in this conversation. And thank you for coming. I just, can I, let me pick up on one practical uh, uh, point. I, so, uh, um, that, that is of interesting consequence. I mean, I think it's right, uh, you know, John has said and. Uh, uh, yeah, we could have another um, uh, diamond versus deer moment. We could tack backwards as we got a better claim in the Supreme Court. But, you know, we're going to have a lot of cases uh, that aren't going to go to the Supreme Court in the interim. Right? I don't think the federal circuit is, is well positioned to say, well, uh, we don't think the court really meant what it said, um, and so we're going to diverge from it, right? And so I think all we can do is wait for another Supreme Court opinion if you think that's the goal. Um, the other thing to note practically about these cases, it is, it's probably right to say we're doing a certain amount of intermixing of the 102, 103 issues, of the infringement issues, as Dan indicates, right, and the question of, of what are the equities of this particular party. Maybe that's a desirable thing, as Seth indicates. But Section 101, as it stands right now, is a pure question of law. There is not a question of fact in a Section 101 inquiry, right? And that means, I think, that these cases are at least uh, procedurally going to be decided by district judges, not by juries. They're going to be decided pre-trial in summary judgment motions and, you know, I think quite early in summary judgment motions because uh, unless there's a disputed issue of claim construction which is relevant to the question of whether or not uh, the, uh, the 101 issue is, is raised, there isn't a factual issue you're going to have to find in discovery, uh, you might move for 101 summary judgment the first month you're in your case. Uh, and in fact, I'm litigating some non-bio cases in which we're doing exactly that. Well, that, that really was the question I was going to ask next is, what's going to be the practical application in courts, or at least some of those practical applications in courts of this decision? Early summary judgment, will we see it concurrent with Markman? Does Markman have to be decided first in most instances? Um, what are going to be some of the things you think district courts 
are going to do with this decision while they wait for more instruction from the Federal Circuit and, and ultimately from the Supreme Court? Well, I think they, it is true that um, they're, they're going to, they have to consider 101 in probably more cases. Now, whether that can be resolved as an issue of summary judgment or whether it can be done later in trial, um, I think depends upon the way you read this opinion. And, and I'm not so sure there are no fact questions, Mark. I mean, after all, it says the, the steps are conventional. I mean, that to me seems like, you know, maybe in some cases everybody will concede these are conventional steps, but it seems to me that in some cases you're gonna say, well, no, these, these steps are not conventional in this context. And indeed, even in this case, I, I think the sort of the raising and lowering, the, 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 the suggestions to raise or low, the, there wasn't actually a step to raise or lower the dosage, um, if you wanted to litigate that, you might ask the question of whether that, whether that step was um, conventional. And this goes to the order in which these, these issues are decided. Um, district courts, I think, I mean, there's, there's people who say, well, it should be decided first, and then the Federal Circuit has suggested maybe it should be decided last. It seems to me that this is just an ordinary issue of law, right? You can't put it either, you can't per se say it has to be first, and by the way, the Supreme Court has a holding on that, where the Supreme Court was presented with these two, with obviousness and patentable subject matter, and they decided obviousness ahead of patentable subject matter. That's the Dan versus Johnson case. So any, anybody who claims that the Supreme Court has held that you, know, you have to do 101 first, there's a case where they themselves absolutely clearly did the complete opposite, which is Dan v. Johnson. Um, and, and, but you can't also say, I don't see how a court could say to a district court, you must do this last. Um, so the district courts are going to have discretion, um, and the litigants have, have the ability to, 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 to order their case in terms of seeking summary judgment, and then the other side's going to oppose summary judgment and say there, there's some factual issues here that you need, to, need, that you'll, you need a better record to develop. So I think these things are going to probably be pushed off later into trial in, in, in at least some cases where, there's, where there are some factors. Although, so it's an, it, it is an interesting procedural question, right? I mean, I, I think it may depend on the question of whether you think there are the uh, facts that have to be resolved uh, by the judge, presumably not by the jury, it, since the whole thing is a question of law. It's not been articulated by the courts as a question of law subject to subsidiary questions of fact. It has been articulated, rightly or wrongly, as a pure question of law. And if that's right, I, I mean, I think it's right to say the district judge gets uh, discretion in how to order it, although it's an awfully hard sale to a district judge to say, Your Honor, we want you to do a jury trial on the 102 issues, on the 112 issues, uh, and then and only then we'd like you to decide uh, this, uh, this uh, 101 issue, which is entirely in your uh, capacity and which might be dispositive of the whole case. I just, you know, as a practical matter, you might get... 102 summary judgments, right, or 112 summary judgments, it seems unlikely you're actually going to get the trial issues vetted before the court gets to 101. Isn't there the danger from this decision, though, that the, the fact, well, the court, when it decides whether something is conventional steps, then has to also decide the issue under 103 and that there could be an um, inconsistency between the decision under 101 and under 103. Well, we'd never get to 103 if it held they, they were all, all the steps were conventional within the meaning of, of this, this decision, right? So I guess if they held they were, uh, that there was some degree of unconventionality about the steps, but maybe there's still, it was, it, it was, I guess it's the other way you're worried about, right? That they could then, they could then, maybe be biased because they'd say, well, it's, there's some degree of unconventionality about the steps, but nonetheless, they're still obvious. I think Breyer does not use uh, conventional and obvious as synonyms here. Um, and indeed, I think the key difference may very well be this question about the nature's library. The conventionality is, is determined right. w w to, to some degree with this idea that you, you, you do consider the, 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 the principles of nature already to be known. So c conventionality has to have, I think, a very narrow meaning. Um, or else, as, as Breyer repeatedly recognizes, if you don't give it a narrow meaning, you blow up every patent, literally every patent. He twice 
recognizes that in this opinion, but at the beginning and at the end, the whole opinion is bookended by the explicit recognition that if you, if you assume every principle of nature is known and then ask the question of, is this you know, obvious in light of the now known principles of nature, then every patent falls. So I think he has to have some more narrow meaning of, of, conven of conventionality. And I think that's, even if he doesn't have that meaning, uh, I think that's what the, uh, the majority of the court does. The majority of the court would have that meaning because they don't want to blow up the entirety of the patent system. I also think, uh, just to uh, pick up on uh, something that Mark said and Dan said, um, I don't. I think it's too facile to say, look, you know, the lower court, district courts, and the federal circuit are not going to be able to say, well, you know, we're not really sure that the Supreme Court meant to go as far as some of these isolated sentences or uh, paragraphs, so we have to just basically give up the candle and get this to the Supreme Court so they can explain it to us. That 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 is not how the process is going to work. It's the sound of one hand clapping. And uh, it's, it is incumbent, let me, let, forget the, before getting to the courts, you know, the solicitor of patents right now has the ginormous, thankless task of instructing thousands of patent examiners how they should be evaluating patent applications and claims as to patents that include a natural process or a law of nature. I mean, not just medical diagnostics and molecular and personalized medicine, but more broadly. I mean, how they are to evaluate what, how they are to, what lessons they're to learn from Prometheus when evaluating an application for a, any patent other than a business method patent, which by definition, I would think by definition, doesn't involve any natural processes or laws of human nature except perhaps some yet undiscovered law of human psychological nature. Na economics and, is not a natural science? <laughs> uh, Yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the, you know, just the, like political the science. It, it's not as if people can just throw up their hands and say, "What are we to make of this?" There's broad language, but there's a narrow reading, and we just we're you know we can't decide. The patent office has to decide. It has to decide with respect to examining patent applications, reissuance, re-exam proceedings. The district courts are going to have to decide one way or the other with respect to claims as to the thousands of outstanding patents, for example, in the area of molecular diagnostics and personalized medicine, is this patentable subject matter or not? And the Federal Circuit has got to decide that. And, and you know, the Supreme Court may or may not turn around and take a case next year or three years from now in this area. My guess is, you know, I mean, they, they, they threw out the, the, um, a rule of thumb for obviousness, um, you know, and opened the world up to, I don't know, do you think it's obvious? Yeah, I sort of think it's obvious. I don't know. There's no real. But, you know, the lower courts have actually done, with a difficult assignment, have done a pretty good job at developing, you know, a refined body of common law adjudication that helps decide these things. Similarly, when the Supreme Court said, you know, it's true that, you know, patents are property and, you know, property rights ordinarily carry with them a remedy of an injunction if there is a threat of an ongoing violation. There's no presumption of an injunction where the property right violated is a patent right. And there were, you know, there have been some periods of confusion and uncertainty about how to evaluate the so-called four-factor test. But the courts for better or for worse, are coming up with new rules of thumb. And the same thing is going to happen here. And I don't think that uh, that either the patent office or responsible courts are going to react to this opinion um, as if it has a lot of broad stuff and therefore there really isn't any there isn't any room for a narrowing interpretation here. And we ought to adopt the view that I, I can't remember whether it was Gene Quinn or Dennis Crouch, but you know, one of the bloggers, you know, on the day of the opinion had a headline of the blog saying, you know, Supreme Court to personalize medicine industry drop dead. 
you know, that's not, presumably that's not what nine justices thought. It's not, I think, how the patent office and the lower federal courts are going to deal with it. That's not to say that I envy any of those institutions. Uh, but I do think there's going to be a common law narrowing of the contours of this very broad opinion. I, I, I guess I want to, I, I think it's absolutely right to say there's going to be a common law development, right, that the district courts, that the PTO, that the federal circuit are going to uh, have to work out the contours of this, uh, figure it out, and so forth. Um, I want to distinguish that from narrowing a little bit, right, in part because um, you know, my sense is that the federal circuit has been burned several times in the Supreme Court where it has been perceived as having its law drift away from the Supreme Court's law. And that doesn't mean that they're going to, um, uh, you know, be unwilling to, to do any common law development. Of course they have to. Um, but it does mean, I think, that they're going to take very seriously uh, their best understanding of what it is that this opinion means. Uh, and so I think if what people are hoping for is a kind of judicial non-acquiescence in which we say, oh, well, this is a case that ought to be limited to its facts and the, and the extreme facts aren't present in any of these other cases and so we can come out the, the way we otherwise would have. I'm, I'm not sure that the Federal Circuit is going to be willing to provide that. I think it's, the, the, Mark, I, I actually agree with both of you. Um, and this way is that uh, absolutely true that uh, there's going to be a common law process here, but there is an intense issue here about the relationship between the Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit that I've been interested in in my own writing for about a decade now. Um, and, and this is a crucial problem that the Supreme Court keeps taking cases and reversing the Federal Circuit, especially on patentable subject matter. It's, they've now granted in the last you know, since the, you know, mid-60s, so about in the last half century, they've granted cert on seven patentable subject matter cases, m far more than any other area. That predates the Federal Circuit. It goes back to the CCPA. But they keep granting in this area, and they've never reversed the Federal Circuit in the other direction, or at the lower court in the other direction, and said, you've been too, you've been too restrictive on patentable subject matter. Sometimes they affirm. A couple times, Deere and Chakrabarty, they affirm. But they've never reversed and said, you, you've just gone too far. And I think that's a terrible, terrible dynamic for the law, that we're getting all these cases and they're, and they're pointing in, in one direction. And, the, and, and the, for the Federal Circuit, it's a serious problem, I think. They, I think part of me, I mean, I think this is not the way that the law, this is probably not what the Federal Circuit has done historically. Um, they will probably narrow this decision, and I, I, I think that, Mark, you're right to say, be cautious about the word narrow, but I think that is what they will do. But I think there's a good argument here that they should really take this at its word, especially in a case coming out of maybe one of these new post-grant review procedures where you'll have the government trying to defend granting a patent, which is the best case, and say to the government, no, you lose under, under uh, Mayo and Prometheus. You lose on that. And see if the government actually takes it up to the Supreme Court with the government behind, with the government saying to the court and explaining to the court, no, no, this is a good patent. This really is. It satisfies 102. It satisfies 103. 103. We really think it's a good patent. And the, the, the lower court was bound by Prometheus. Um, but you, you really have to rethink this doctrine. If that doesn't happen, we're going to continue to have this dynamic, which is that the Federal Circuit, I think, will narrow this case. And then within a few years, maybe sooner, um, the, uh, if, if, a, if, what is it, the A&P case, right, gets up to the Supreme Court, um, the, 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 court will, uh, uh, the court will once again, at some point, reverse the Federal Circuit. And I think that's a bad dynamic in, in terms of constructing law in this area. I think one of the things that uh, Professor Lemley talked about was draftsmen, um, these sly, clever draftsmen. Maybe there's a few out in the audience today um, that, are, that are looking for some guidance. Um, and I agree there's a lot of language in this decision that doesn't seem particularly helpful, but the one sentence that I thought maybe draftsmen could take some heart in was, was the, the statement, our conclusion rests upon an examination of the particular claims before us. So maybe there is, there is 
some guidance to be taken out of this decision and maybe the panelists could, could um, discuss what they think would be a better way to claim what Prometheus claimed you know, in, the, in this particular patent and just generally for these types of patents, what might be helpful going forward. I would like to say that, that those were two places in the Mayo opinion that really uh, upset me, uh, where they made this uh, nefarious intent allegation against patent attorneys that I think is unjustified and I think only adds fire to the flame of discontent and disharmony that we have amongst the patent bar. You know, I personally get attacked all the time for my motivations and it's fine. You know, I represent my clients. I don't care what other people think about me, but I would never attack other people's motivations either. And so calling people draftsman's art or a lawyer's trick, I think is just not helpful to the conversation at all. Um, now, when I'm talking to my students, I always tell them the following phrase. If you don't get at least some invalid patent claims for your client, you have committed malpractice. Now, why would I say that? Why would I tell my clients to get claims that are invalid? Because we all know that this law is so dynamic, so unpredictable, you don't know what you're getting today, whether it will or will not be valid in the future. I'm just being a mechanic about it. We don't know what's gonna work in the future. So if you're not being aggressive enough in pursuing claims, uh, then you haven't done your client the service that your client is paying you for. Um, at the same time, for 101 to become an issue in any case has to be a perfect storm. Because we all know defendants will always prefer a non-infringement defense. It's got a lower burden of proof. It also is sometimes to your competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis other players in the marketplace. You don't want to destroy the patent in any way that allows all your other competitors to free ride on that. You just want a favorable non-infringement opinion so that the patent remains as an obstacle perhaps to others. So for 101 to be raised in a case is a quite uh, unlikely scenario, I think, most often. And so the worry that we have about 101, I think we could probably take a percentage of it and say, yes, that's an interesting soap opera and we'll continue back to it when the next movie comes out in a couple years. Uh, but let's spend more of our focus on making sure we don't even become one of those cases, because you're right. As a practical person, you just care about not letting your case, if you're the patent owner, getting before the Supreme Court. I mean, odds are you're gonna do better staying at the Federal Circuit and not getting the Supreme Court. So if I was advising someone here, that means don't allow there to be certain facts or behavior in your case which can increase the likelihood of making your case sexy enough for the justices to take. You wanna be boring, you wanna be convoluted, you wanna be troublesome, you know, just a, an unsavory case for them to take. And sometimes patent holders are a little bit, have a little bit too much uh, pride of ownership in their work. And we've all seen this, the whole like not invented here thing, I invented this, and we've all had clients like that uh, who wanna make sure that their reputation is upheld. And we all know, you know, it's like a de criminal defense client who's like, well, I'm innocent, I wanna take the stand. Well, you run the risk. So when you're a patent holder, you're not willing to concede a little bit and uh, lose a little face in order to get a case resolved so you can move on and do other things with your life, you risk this perfect storm accumulating, which then creates these cases for us to discuss and think about. Let me, let me try to tackle the, the question, right? Is there a way to draft around this? Um, I mean, I, the, I mean, so the obvious thing you can do that they didn't do in this case, and if this solves the problem, then it turns out to be trivial, uh, right, is you could actually express the, uh, the uh, second administering step. You could require that the uh, uh, doctor modify the dosage and give the modified dosage to a new patient, right? You might even try to make it a little bit more detailed and specific by giving actual dosage recommendations for patients of particular types if you have that information. You know, if the answer is that's all that's required to satisfy the court, well, you might run into some other practical problems, right? The question of who is the direct infringer gets a little harder if you've got both a doctor uh, administering the drug and a lab, presumably separately, uh, doing the calculation for you. Uh, but by and large, life goes on uh, as it was. I don't think that's the way the court's gonna come out. Uh, so the, the analogy here is to Bilski, 
right? Uh, and, and, and the question, you know, unanswered at the time and uh, of, well, if I, add, if I take Bilski's patent claims uh, to a method of hedging uh, risk in the, in the coal markets and I add the words in a computer at the end, have I made it patentable subject matter? Have I changed the result? If so, right, not much was going to change. The, the verdict's not completely out because there are Federal Circuit opinions going in different directions, but by and large, I think the majority seems to be saying, no, it's not sufficient to say in a computer to render an otherwise unpatentable invention patentable. My guess is they're going to say the same, the equivalent thing here. It's not sufficient to say uh, administer the drug once you've done the, the calculation based on the law of nature and you're fine. Um, if that's right, if, if that doesn't help, uh, then it's awfully hard to know what it is actually that you're going to be able to add using the, the draftsman's art that's going to turn this invention into something patentable. Uh, and that might lead us, I know we've got some limited amount of time, but we probably ought to say at least a little bit about the AMP case, right, which is now on remand from the, uh, from the Supreme Court to consider a somewhat analogous question, right, which is have I added enough, more than a significant amount, a, a significant amount to the law of nature when I patent my isolated DNA claims? So, yeah, maybe we should go to uh, the AMP versus Myriad case. Um, and it's technically let's start AMP with the versus USPTO. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I say got the a first I'll party right. I'll, I'll compromise with AMP versus Myriad. Okay. Um, Let's just start with the, the claims to the isolated DNA. How do you think the case is going to come out? And I will allow the panelists also to say how they believe the case should come out. All right, well, I'll go first. Um, the, I mean, I think this was, uh, as the majority opinion, well, there were three different opinions in the original Federal Circuit case. I think the vote for patentability of uh, isolated but otherwise unchanged genomic DNA claims was razor thin in the first instance, right? Judge Lurie said, oh, it's an entirely different chemical because you've separated it from the chromosome and therefore you had to break a bond. Uh, Judge Bryson in dissent said, that can't be the, the reasoning. That's like saying if I snap a leaf off a tree, I've made a new thing because uh, I broke a bond. And Judge Moore in her concurrence said, well, you know, I'm kind of attracted to Judge Bryson's point, but we've had a biotech industry for a long time, and they seem to depend on the fact that we had these patents, and so I'm going uh, to go along. I think it's much harder after Mayo to look at a patent claim that is just, I took something in the natural world and I isolated it from its surroundings and say that has significant non-conventional, non-obvious uh, uh, activity other than the natural thing itself. Right, uh, that the inventive concept, as the court puts it in Mayo, is something other than the actual uh, 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 DNA sequence. So my, inc my inclination, I mean, I don't, you know, we are federal circuit judges in the room, and of course they're going to do whatever they're going to, to do. But I, my guess, if I had to bet, was uh, that that the genomic DNA holding can't be sustained under Mayo. Professor Duffy. Oh, okay. Maybe everybody else has got clients, yeah. uh, right? Got, yeah, there's issues, right? So, uh, so I don't have any, I don't have a, a paying dog in this fight. So, uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, got too many other dogs in fights. Um, so, um, I think that uh, uh, I've always, I've taught for years, Learned Hand's opinion as the law. That Learned Hand got it right when he said that isolating and purifying something. Uh, was sufficient. Uh, and I've always thought that's the right policy result, and I thought that that's the right reading of the, of the patent statute. Um, but after this opinion comes down, I, I think that um, I, I, I find myself, you know, thinking that, you know, to some extent I agree with Mark, that I think that the Federal Circuit sort of reading this opinion, which has some broad language in it, um, has to sort of may very well have to just sort of cut through this and, and just invalidate all of the claims that are at issue in this case. And, and I think a lot more claims, which is my point about not necessarily reading this case narrowly, uh, but reading it for, you know, sort of on the fair beam, which is going to cause a lot of dislocations in a lot of industries. 
Um, and, and ultimately, the Supreme Court's going to have to come back to it. And hopefully, the Supreme Court will at some point realize that they will say, uh, no, we didn't mean that. We didn't really mean all that we, you know, that, you know, maybe perhaps fairly reading just that opinion, you might have thought we meant. But nonetheless, we, we're going to cut back on that opinion. Uh, because if, the, if that doesn't happen, then you have this continuing dynamic, which the, the Supreme Court, it, the Federal Circuit is, is narrowing the, the Supreme Court's opinions in, in ways that I think are actually good, I think. I, mean, I understand Dan has, Dan has clients and would maybe think differently. Um, but I think are probably good in a policy sense and consistent with the, with the, with the patent statute. But then the Supreme Court is just, is just going to think, well, this, the Federal Circuit is up to it again. And we've got to reverse yet again. Um, that, I think, is, a, is an extraordinarily uh, a bad dynamic. Um, so I think, the, uh, I think that the claim should be patentable under the best vision of the, of the patent statute. But I think that they are, um, they are likely, they probably given this opinion, sort of and taking this opinion in a fair read probably means that they, those claims go down and many, many other claims go down. And I, so, I mean, CD&A CD patents are the, are the other claims at issue in that case, and I think that's a slightly harder step, although, again, after Mayo, I'm not sure it comes to a different result. I think John's probably right. Uh, so there, the, the added distinction is, well, I'm not merely uh, removing something from nature. I am creating a new thing. And so you can imagine drawing a line that says, oh, the CD&A is created. It doesn't, with, with sort of very uh, uh, minor exceptions, exist in nature. The problem is that it's created by this uh, uh, entirely simple process auto the, from, from the natural uh, uh, DNA, and particularly from the, from the natural messenger RNA, right? So it's a, it would be a reasonably formalistic distinction to say, well, it's not in nature, and so it's patentable, even though it's a, it's an, it's a simple kind of one-step process to, to move it from nature. I think really the int one of the most interesting questions in the case will be which United States shows up. Um, you know, the... PTO or the White House. <laughs> well, the, the United States that... Um, the, the, the Porsche part of the executive branch that examined patents and issued a couple thousand patents that are functionally identical to the patents at issue in the myriad AMP case, the United States that actually held title to some of the patents uh, and patent claims that were disavowed in the federal circuit, or um, you know, whoever happens to be the Solicitor General or Acting Solicitor General speaking on behalf of the United States and coming into the Federal Circuit to explain that all of this can be answered through the use of a magic microscope. And, you know, <laughs> I think it's not a foregone, the position that the United States will take, uh, assuming that the Federal Circuit uh, solicits, you know, supplemental briefs and hears argument, again in the case, the position the United States will take is not a foregone conclusion. It will be extremely interesting to, you know, to see because it will be an early, um, perhaps the first opportunity for the United States with the help of the Solicitor General, such as it is, to explicate some of the, what it understands to be some of the contours of the Prometheus versus Mayo case. So whenever we're talking about this case, I always feel compelled to remind people of a fact that I think I feel very personally proud of that doesn't get recognized. So there are seven patents involved in the case. And in those seven patents, there's a total of 120 claims relating to all sorts of things that have to do with Myriad's business. We didn't challenge the patent eligibility of all 120 claims in all seven patents. So you want to know how many claims we challenged? 15. So over 105, we did not challenge. We didn't even think we had a basis whatsoever to say that they were unpatentable subject matter. Only 15 out of 120 did we say we think crossed the line. And the Federal Circuit agreed with us on half of those, 3-0, just like the district court does, the, me the method of 
comparing and then determining. So we're only really talking about five or six claims now. And so when we made that decision, we didn't want to come across as just categorically opposed to all patenting here, because that's not my position. And I wouldn't ever argue for that position, that every patent related to genes, all gene patents should just be thrown in the garbage can. I get represented as having that position, but it's not my position. But there are some claims that sometimes cross the line. In fact, as I tell my students, that's a good thing. You should get some claims across the line and wait for someone to call you out on it. Okay, so there are some claims here that cross the line. We went through a painstaking claim by claim analysis to determine which claims we're gonna challenge. And we don't get any respect for that. So I'm just gonna ask you to just consider giving us a little bit of respect for the moderateness of our issues that we've raised. Uh, and then some of the claims we didn't challenge involve using DNA segments as probes, using DNA segments as primary, and we didn't challenge those. And yet those are the uses that Judge Lori found to be so compelling to allow the patentability of an entire almost chromosome. Now we also recognize in our case there was no claim construction. So when we're talking about a claim that comprises an isolated DNA, that doesn't exclude the entire chromosome that it exists on. And so he said, well, because that claim includes something that could be used as a probe or primer, that gives a, that gives a, a patent eligibility to that claim. And, and it doesn't distinguish from the claims that were narrowly drawn just to those particular uses. Now, Judge Moore is more um, intellectually honest about this when she says, look, these claims are very broad, especially the claim to say a DNA sequence having at least 15 nucleotides, but could have any infinite number. She says, well, there are some DNA fragments that would exist in there that would be eligible because they have these new use pros or primers, but some of them are so big, they can't be made for those new uses. And so she then punts to industry reliance. I have no objection whatsoever to her discussing the reliance of the industry on these patents. Of course, that's a very valid interest. Um, but what upset me personally was that the interests of my clients of just having, I don't represent a commercial competitor, I don't have paying clients. I do all my work pro bono, so does the ACLU. We represent patients who just want to know whether or not they're going to get breast cancer. And their doctor said, you should have someone looking inside your genes and I'm willing to do that for you for free if you can't afford the price that they want to pay. I personally, if my doctor told me that, I have no problem paying Myriad whatever they want. They want to charge me $25,000, $50,000, I'll pay whatever I want. But as a society, we have to have all areas of our law respect those with less means those who are poorest amongst us, or we really start to erode the legitimacy of that law. So, so long as patent law doesn't appreciate and respect these interests, and so long as they continue to get ignored, as Judge Moore did, completely ignored, not even mentioned, the law will continue to cause situations like this where we have conflicting interests that derive us to bring us to these cases. So, you know, the question earlier was, well, how would you amend the claim? It's kind of like blaming the referee at the end of a football game for a bad call. Any good coach would say, if you leave it to the referee at the end of the game to make a bad call, you made 50 million mistakes earlier in the game that could have taken it out of the referee's hands. So anyone who says, well, I don't like the call that the referees are making here, there's other decisions they could have made. So those are the only points I like to make sure everyone's aware of when we're talking about uh, the AMP case. Maybe at this point uh, we should open it up for questions. It's supposed to go to the Yeah, go to the microphone would be great. Uh, please go ahead. In Fluke, there was language that an algorithm is like a law of nature, and that wasn't explicitly reaffirmed in uh, Mayo, but do you think that Mayo is going to apply with full force outside the bioscience context to electronics or computer programming type patents? So I don't know about full force, but I, you know, uh, I just started off with the kind of payoff quote from Mayo and it started this panel off, right, where the Supreme Court says, simply appending conventional steps specified at a high level of generality to laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas <coughs> cannot make those laws, phenomena, and ideas patentable. That's not a statement about laws of nature. That's a general statement about the exclusions from patentable subject matter right. that seems to encompass within it Bilski, a lot of the court's discussion of reconciling its case law and the lessons from those case law talks about Benson, Fluke, Deere, right? These are not uh, medical cases. So yeah, I think the answer is um, uh, it reinforces the idea that you've got to have something more than 
abstract idea plus I put it in a computer, right? Or abstract idea uh, plus I, uh, uh, you know, did this, did this data processing step to it uh, in order to make it patentable. Electrons just keep behaving predictably according to laws of nature. <laughs> It's also true that I think you learn, you learn more about a, a court's real views from its five to four decisions than you do from its unanimous decisions. So I think you have to look at the Bilski case. And there, at least uh, on the portions of the opinion, uh, this was actually plurality portions of the opinion, but it was signed by four justices, they talked a lot about how we have to interpret the patent laws to cover this, the, the innovations of this new information age. Um, I think that, that those justices, who also were, were started out with textualism as their basis for interpreting 101 and explicitly did not sign on to the dissent's view, which is all, this is all common law and it's not a statute, those justices are very, very unlikely to take such a broad view of Mayo in a completely different field with a completely different subject to have it have a huge footprint that, that invalidates a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, software patents. I'll just be quick. I caution people against trying to come up with categories. I have no idea what it means to be a software patent. I have no idea what it means to be a business method patent. I think it's erroneous to try to come up with these categories because then you just get argue what patent falls within or outside of that category. A patent is a patent. You have to investigate each claim for itself, and you just have to look at those facts. And getting sidetracked on these debates about software patents or any other kind of things, I think, is just unproductive and distracting. And, and, and I think it's just improper analysis. I generally agree with you. I want to make that clear. But but in in things that are like software patents, you always have a physical machine, and you can talk more and more about the attributes of that physical machine to the extent that you need to. And I just think that the justices. Many of them, maybe not just as prior, but many of them, if they're confronted with that kind of claim and somebody's saying, well, it's all a principle of nature, are going to think that that's a little bit of a curious analogy rather than that this case square on covers that situation. I think we have time for one more question. Sorry. So the way I've described these cases to colleagues, business colleagues, and lawyers who are not patent practitioners is that essentially the way to think about them is you know you're playing a board game like Monopoly you're three quarters of the way through the game and somebody shakes up the board and the pieces land where they are and you've sort of got to pull it back together and I think to me that's the way that business people and investors investing in life sciences have to look at this and that creates its own set of challenges. And I guess my question, and I'd love to get your thoughts on is, you know, fundamentally, is there some risk that the Supreme Court got it wrong? And let me qualify that, that they got it wrong from a poly pers policy perspective if the outcome is that this gets generally and broadly applied. And the reason I ask that is, I think the fundamental you know, holding as it's been articulated that everybody can nod their head on and say, okay, that feels okay, is that there's a, there's a broad principle of nature and the claim says apply it. And that's just too broad. Nobody should have a monopoly in that. Nobody, as Jefferson would say, should suffer the embarrassment of a monopoly for that. I, I guess we should just question that because one of the things that broad early claims do is they lead to earlier disclosure. And one of the things earlier disclosure does leads to earlier follow-on innovations, which themselves are separately patentable underneath that broad scope. And I think there's been a lot of academic studies that show this has been a real engine, a real part of our horsepower in the United States. And there is some risk that as you take away the opportunity for broad early landscape investments, you will not as quickly, or maybe not at all, arrive at some of these discoveries because, or you'll never arrive at practical applications of those because you won't have the investment. And, you know, the Supreme Court does have the final word, so by definition they didn't get it wrong, but I guess the real question is from a policy grounds, we shouldn't automatically assume that broad landscape claims lead to an exclusion. Actually, I think they can accelerate development 
And if there's a business reason for it, the people will find a way, a commercial reason, to find a way to work together and actually enable that. So, thank you. First of all, I want to say you're, I, I think you're right. I, I have a lot of sympathy for that view from a policy perspective. It already, um, and I think academic-like inventors are the people who are, who should be the most nervous about this decision. The more that what you discover and what you think you're discovering in could fairly be characterized as a law of nature, the more this decision should absolutely worry you. Note that that's not new, though. The Ariad en banc decision also said, well, some of this stuff could really be basic research, and, and that's exactly the kind of thing that should be unpatentable. Um, so there, this decision coupled with Ariad should make anybody who's investing in academic re, cutting edge research extremely nervous. And one, there, there are two possibilities. One is you try to get a remedy from Congress. You say this is bad policy and, and we should go to Congress. That's, that's one remedy. The other remedy which you note is secrecy. Until you get the practical applications, until you get something that's indisputably you know, a practical application. Um, those are the two remedies that I think academic, you know, sort of cutting edge investigators have. Uh, and, and they have uncertainty. There's no doubt that they have uncertainty. They have greater uncertainty now. They could go to Congress if they could, if, if, if Congress is willing to do that. I don't know, I'm not a lobbyist, so I don't know what the odds are on that. Um, but I think secrecy is their immediate self-help remedy. And you're absolutely right that that will slow down disclosure. I think the question you're basically asking is, can we have faith that our system will work to provide the law that's the best for all Americans, not just your industry, but also the people that I'm concerned about? Uh, you know, and, and I have that faith, because we have a lot of smart lawyers. Uh, as long as we ensure that our clients have access to good lawyers, continue to have access to the most excellent judiciary in the world, uh, we will continue to get the best decisions in the world. And so I'm not too worried about the future, even though I can't see it per se and tell you what's going to happen. Uh, I would just, uh, you know, then caution that, um, you know, in that battleground for future policy decisions, uh, you know, being uh, third behind the Chamber of Commerce and Big Oil and the amount of lobbying access does not make me uh, worry that the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry is not going to be able to have more than its fair day, uh, either on Capitol Hill or in the courts. What I worry is about is people who have contrary interests or uh, interests on the other side of those interests not getting adequate access to our legal system so that we ensure the results are fair for everyone. Hey, well, please uh, join me in uh, thanking our panelists.